You know, Joe is a RISD graduate, uh, one of our proud graduates, and uh, I want to do a little test. Let's see here. So uh, first of all, you know how hard it is to like look at slides. It's kind of boring after a while. So I brought stuff. And stuff is dangerous because it gets lost, but I solved the problem. So I have two stuffs here, and I want you to pass them around in this audience while we're talking. Uh, and uh, the person, it's like musical chairs, the person who like has it last gets to keep it. Um, they're RISD things, and RISD things are kind of unique, and uh, Joe is an example of that kind of thinking. And uh, so I have a test for Joe, first of all, four right, objects. John. Ready, Joe? Good morning. Good morning, Joe. What is that? <sighs> that is a prototype for a shelter for uh, when there's a natural disaster and you need to erect a, a quick shelter for people who are displaced by a natural disaster. Notice I'm surprising Joe with this test, by the way. Thank you, Joe, excellent answer. This is by one of your fellow uh, graduates. It's a, uh, not a shelter model. It's uh, what appears to be a perfect styrofoam cup. Yet when you pick it up, you realize it's a perfect glass cup, painted uh, white. It's a gorgeous object, it's heavy. You know, you think of styrofoam cup as light and it's heavy and uh, it's like magical. This object, Joe, what is that? <laughs> hmm. John, I think, I think we're looking at uh, something made in the ceramics department. I think that this is something, you know, it, it could be a mini prototype for a cooler. It could very well be a, um, a container for jewelry. Jewelry. Uh -huh. Well, Joe, when I purchased this object, because I bought all these objects, by the way, from RISD graduates, etc., I was wondering what was in that cooler, Joe, and I discovered it was basically, you know, it's like a little elegant little piece, and you open up and there's a, it's bloody brains, basically. Um, interesting, isn't it? Um, another example, and these are examples of what I find at RISD, an art school, this creativity of all kinds of flavors. Now we're gonna go to the home stretch here. Um, Wait, just, just curious, how much was the cooler? This was, a, this was only $8. Man, what a buy. Uh, the styrofoam cup was expensive. Um, this object here, Joe, there you go. Okay. okay. This object here I found in a trash bin. Don't worry, it was in a dry trash bin. Got it. So this is, uh, this is paper. There's some masking tape on this. Uh, it's pretty light. And this is from the first year program. And uh, can you talk a bit about Nature Lab a bit? Nature, your experience in that? Yeah, at RISD there's this phenomenal resource called the Nature Lab. And it's almost as old as the campus itself, over 100 years old. And imagine a library, but instead of being filled with books, it's filled with objects from nature. Insects, skeletons, things in jars, all kinds of plants and animals. And it is like, it's like whatever you felt when you were a kid walking into a toy store, this is what you feel when you a designer walking into the nature lab. And so when I found it on the ground, I felt like, and RISD people are trying to emulate nature with every type of material, and uh, it's just a lovely object. Let me pass it over here to person wearing over here. Let's pass it around. Just like, oh, what is that on the ground? Um, this object here, I've kept for two years, and I'm glad to give it away to someone special out there, because this is, this, this I just love, and here we go, Joe. It's a, it's a notebook. And it's a, it's, a, it's a ruled notebook, and if Scott was, Scott's over there, he's the notebook guy. Um, this is a ruled notebook, and uh, it's just a notebook, you know, with lines on it and everything. Um, but when you look closely at it, what it is, it's, uh, if you unfold it, it's basically someone has ruled with a pencil these perfect long lines uh, and made this notebook um, which is very deceivingly simple. Uh, it's elegantly constructed. Uh, Joe, thoughts about this notebook, please? I think this is a pretty good example of an object that, that 
you'd see on campus and you'd wonder, is that, is it art or is that design? Which is like the, the common question you, that comes up on campus. When I look at something like that, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's functional, but it also, you know, becomes something else. And I think you said it uh, great once before, John, you said, uh, art raises questions and design answers questions. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I've actually always thought about that since, you know, I was on campus, out in the world, you know, looking at objects. Uh, the power of art is that it, it, you know, causes us to ask questions about what is that? And it helps us think deeply about something. And of course, design you know, brings the function and uh, the usefulness to it. And that's the beginning. That was a surprise thing for Joe. I want to thank Joe for taking the test with me, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Um, these are four examples that I come from MIT originally. I was a computer science major. And I always think of programming. You know, different languages like Lisp and Python and C and, you know, functional versus symbolic. And in a sense, when you're in an art school, a real art school, you see all the different flavors of design because we hear design thinking so much, don't we? Hear design and, and we hear of Joe Gebbia as a designer founder. What does that mean to you, Joe? What does that mean? Well, I think technically it means that you graduated from design school with a, a BFA and you went and founded a company. Uh, but beyond that, I think that um, designer founders is, is a relatively new term, um, certainly out in Silicon Valley. It's this notion that uh, the traditional model of who can start a tech company isn't what it used to be. That you don't necessarily need to come from a computer science program or an MBA program, uh, but you can actually come from an art and design background and apply the same things that you'd learn in, in an art and design studio towards, towards a business. And I remember, you know, in the early days, that was, actually, that was actually a liability for us. When we first started to meet investors, you know, back in 2008, um, very few had ever met founders that came from art school. And I said, but wait, what about the technical expertise? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the story goes, back in 2008, we met 20 people and, and zero of them invested in us. Um, and I think we've come, actually come a long way since 2008 where um, you have investors and, and VCs actually looking for teams that have design thinking built into the founding, the founding level. Because technology has become a commodity, basically. You can put the parts together, but the creativity is a bit hard to come by. But why is that? There's so many artists and designers out there. Why is it, like Scott's got all of them in his community, why is it that they aren't tapped for companies the way you have achieved? I think you, you know, starting a company is solving a problem. And, and the beautiful thing about design school is, is you're trained to solve a problem. It doesn't matter if you're an architect, fashion designer, furniture designer, industrial design. Um, you know, reflecting on, on the time that, that I had at RISD, it was purely about problem solving. And, you know, when you're in the early stage of a startup, every day you're problem solving. I gotta say that, you know, really a lot of my frame came from when I was at the Media Lab, um, where, uh, you know, I mean, you can make things blink, you can make things larger, faster, uh, and more, with more RAM, less RAM, et cetera. Uh, it's subtle, and if you're a technologist, you'll see the subtleties. And you know, being in an art school full time, I have the funniest experiences. Like one of uh, Joe's teachers is Roseanne Summerson, a master furniture designer. And every time I like sit down, like on a chair, because she's a chair expert, she can talk about a chair like no one else can talk about a chair. And, and can you talk about how like designers have a vocabulary? I think that designers have the, um, you know, we're trained to look at something in different ways. And what, what may be a chair or maybe a cup or maybe a notebook, uh, designers can start to connect dots that maybe weren't so obvious before. Um, you know, I'd say that that's actually, if you want to, kind of just peel away the layers of what design is. It's connecting things that, that aren't, aren't obvious at first and putting them together in new and different ways. 
And, and that ability I've seen, uh, you know, we had some executives from Samsung visiting, I was telling you. You know, executive, top executives and a person whispered to me, they never leave the company. And they were there at, in Nature Lab and, and we had them looking at microscopes and drawing from the microscope and we couldn't get them to leave because they were so entranced by this directness of seeing and making and that loop. Can you talk about that loop a bit, that loop of iteration? Yeah, um, design is, uh, and certainly what, what we, they taught us, um, it's kind of like design something that delights you. Like design something that people want. That's step one. Step two is release it. Get it out to the world, ship it, put it into the hands of people actually using it. And the third step is iterate. Observe, watch how people are using uh, what you'd come up with and iterate like crazy. And then the theme of iteration, when Joe and I began discussing this, we thought we'd flip, so you can now, I'm in the hot seat now. Okay, because I have a few questions here. <laughs> um, so, John, I'm curious about a couple things. Um, you know, on the topic of design thinking, generally I'm, I'm curious, what is, what is something that you've seen from your perspective that everyone in this room should know about design thinking? Oh. Um, well, this is the topic of my talk at Davos coming up. I'm going to talk about how design thinking bothers me because uh, I recently looked online because that's where we all look, right? And I found like seven flavors of design thinking, definitive flavors of design thinking. You got the frog style thinking, you have the IDEO style thinking, you have Roger Martin, you got Wikipedia. I mean, so design thinking is just so confusing. What's interesting is that the scientific method isn't confusing, right? The scientific method, we all know it. It's the five steps, it makes sense. So design thinking is not a method. Um, it can't be coded in an algorithm. Um, we tend to look for logic. And uh, you know, I must say at this hotel, Baya Risharov, he was in the hotel. Um, you know, if you, if, you, if, you walk up, if you walk up the stairs, you'll see how the stairs have these, this beautiful, perfect round, element, it's a circle element, you know, it's, it's perfect geometry. And I was thinking about how like, some people think that design, designers have some kind of logic, it's a rational pattern everyone's using. Um, that's one flavor of design, it's the skeleton of design, but the beauty comes from what you experience and the emotions, the facial expressions, the subtleties, and that, there's no design thinking algorithm for it, I believe. Mm. Um, it, on the topic of design thinking, um, I, I believe the secret sauce behind design thinking is empathy. Hmm. Can you speak to that? What is the role of empathy in design speaking to you? Um, you know, it's funny when I was asking Joe a bit about why he, um, he chose industrial design because I have a lot of students come up to me and say like, what should I become? What major should I be? And I say, that doesn't matter. Don't worry. You'll end up something else. Just don't stress over it, you know? Like all of you here, I'm sure you took some major and you're doing something completely different, right? Um, uh, but um, uh, there was one student came to me, should I be a graphic designer or an industrial designer? And I would talk to Joe about this. And Joe said, well, the thing he liked about being an industrial designer was how um, in graphic design, uh, some, 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 uh, the, the norm is to talk about the client. Uh, and in industrial design, the norm is to talk about the customer, the user. Um, so, uh, I think that um, uh, depending upon how, which major you are, you tend to focus on the empathy versus the, the, the thing. And I have to say I love the thing. Um, graphic designers who fixate over making something the right red, you know them. Remember before book design, remember you make a cover and it was the wrong red. Reprint it. That's crazy, that's like, that's environmentally bad. No, reprint the whole thing, you know, and then you, they reprint the whole book and the red's still wrong. That kind of craziness, I'm totally okay with because that's where this ability to make green shoes comes from. Um, at the same time, there's this empathy aspect, there's the earth aspect, designers are awakening to it, leaving the materiality, leaving the perfection. It's very powerful today how designers are changing. Well, there was a, I remember this very distinctly, this one moment at RISD that kind of ingrained this in me, you know, for the rest of my life, which was we had a, as industrial designers, we had to redesign a medical device. And our professor took the entire class, 
of you know, 20 or so industrial designers to the, the Rhode Island State Hospital. And uh, it was the first time where uh, we were taught the lesson to become the patient. Become the person that you're actually designing for. So here we are at the hospital. We're not only observing uh, the existing solution in use and watching how people fumble with it and drop it on the floor and kind of all these things. But then we actually lay down in the bed and we become the patient and we feel the device applied to us and we start to empathize mm -hmm. with what it actually feels like to be the person in the bed with this device. And uh, from those insights, that's what informed and inspired our designs. And I've never forgotten that lesson. Even, even on the web, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's physical, I think even on the web, there's that, still that, that power of empathy. Well, empathy is funny. You know, you know how we enter the, this area? You know, we, we take off our coats, we're cold, we're rushing in, and there's that terrible step, that, that step there, that if you didn't see it, you're gonna get hurt. The one without the rail. Yeah, and that's design. That's design working against you. Uh, you know, uh, and that kind of design, there's a lot of it, um, and I think it comes from a certain flavor of design, uh, but I think empathy is rising because the market demands it, especially because of that, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, let's see. Uh, John, I'm really curious to hear, how do you keep a 146-year-old institution fresh? Oh. He's talking about my college. Um, I, uh, I used to be at the Media Lab. I headed research there, and uh, um, it, it's, it, Media was a startup at MIT, like a brand new company at MIT, and, and I'm at RISD now, which is uh, really old. It's over a century old, and I call it end up. Startup versus an end up. It ended up. Um, and there's nothing wrong with an end up, by the way, because startups want to become end ups. It's a stable system. And, and, but end ups today want to get startup y. And, you know, as someone who came from startup y world to end up y world, uh, it's been very interesting, I have to say that. Um, if anything, I've discovered that end up -ies have a great role right now because they represent something that is classic. Um, there's such value in something that's classic and great. People are trying to do something great. We are, quote unquote, great. Um, I would say that uh, what I've tried to do is to really understand what makes that classic thing, like, like, a, like a great brand. You pick up a great brand, old brand, you figure out what's good about it, and find ways to talk about it. That's how we're involved in Silicon Valley or in Washington, D.C., taking the same powerful design brand and communicating it to new audiences. That's been fun. How would you, uh, how would you define the culture at RISD? Like, how would you describe what, what, the, what the culture oh. is? Well, um, I find RISD and MIT very similar. I, I think of like uh, RISD as MIT for the right brain people. Um, it's, it's similarly intense and um, it's uh, terribly difficult and hard as a school. So I sympathize, and MIT, you know, that's the same work ethos, you know, no pain, you know, no pain. Um, but what I find what's different is that people are a lot happier, uh, which is, it's like everyone's smiling but in pain. Uh, it's a bit strange. <laughs> I can't describe it. It's a little bit weird, but I've seen that. Excellent. Um, smiles of pain. I remember them well. Let's see. So um, I'm curious to, to get your take on this. Um, how, because this is something that, that we're thinking about every day as, as you know, you're an end up, we're a startup, uh, our company's getting bigger, and a lot of what we employ are things that came from RISD in terms of how we have a creative atmosphere, how we think about ideas, how the company is really a container for ideas. Um, how, how do you recommend to myself and maybe to others here today, as a company gets bigger, how does it get more creative instead of less creative? Yeah, well that was that great question you were asking me while I'm in coffee and I don't have the answer to that, sorry. Um, but um, I mean, you're from Fortune or major magazine. Um, major magazines, major corporations, people who are from these things that are great, that have scaled and are great, but have a problem understanding whether or not they are great or not. Um, I find that um, because, because you've done well in an end up, you're, and if you can figure out what made you good as an end up, 
I mean, it's the classic, you know, Jim Collins. It's like if you figure what, what that, that, that thing, that's the flywheel. Same with your company getting larger. I think it's really corny, but um, uh, what was it? Um, my favorite analogy is how, um, what was it? You know, John Gardner, who's read John Gardner? If you haven't read John Gardner, you have to read John, John Gardner. I mean, he's like the uh, Kerning and Ritchie of, C, uh, of leadership, basically. Um, and John Gardner uh, has all the answers. So I say read John Gardner. All right. <laughs> John Gardner it is. Um, there's, there's one thing that, that I found that uh, I'd be curious how this could apply at RISD. Um, it's, it's building a culture of, of yes and rather than no. So as people come up to you with ideas for something, uh, it's not like you don't shut it down, maybe it's not an idea you're going to employ right away, but uh, building a culture of yes, and what if the idea became this? And you build a culture of people that build on top of the ideas of others. How do you see that play out? Um, well, I see the clock and I see the gentleman sort of waving at us. Uh, so I want to say that, um, who's a leader here? leader here. Like being a leader is very hard, as we know. Um, it, it doesn't have the, the goodness of being a doer, because a doer gets to do all the time. Um, and when a leader says, go ahead and do it, you could get screwed terribly by that, go ahead, do it kind of thing, because little, little, little vibrations in you become gigantic tornadoes um, uh, further out in the organization. Um, I think the challenge is for leaders to feel that they can do that, that they can, to your point we were talking earlier before, creating zones where you can make mistakes, where you can fail in public and say, I'm gonna fail in public and watch out kind of thing. Um, that's how to do it, I believe. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks, John. Thank you, guys. <laughs>